make this lecture series possible. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Susan Kidwell, who is going to be discussing shells and other remnants of marine life to understand how changes in species composition and, uh, and abundance over time in Southern California what, and what we learn from those changes in, in patterns. <clears throat> professor Kidwell is the William Rainey Harper Professor in Geophysical Sciences and in the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program for the Committee on Evolutionary Biology at the University of Chicago. She's taught there since 1985. She's a sedimentary geologist and a paleoecologist who has combined geological fieldwork, laboratory experiments, statistical meta-analysis, and measurements in modern marine environments to investigate how the fossil record forms and how it is, can be used to understand the past and also to anticipate the future of today's biodiversity. <clears throat> Susan grew up in Virginia, got a bachelor's degree at William & Mary, got her PhD from Yale University, spent a year at USC, then several years at the University of Arizona, and went to the University of Chicago and has been there since 1985. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's a recipient of multiple awards including the 2015 Mary Clark Thompson Medal from the National Academy of Sciences. And it's a real pleasure to have Susan Kidwell with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Susan. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I especially like um, visiting Southern California, where people sort of know the geography of the project. Uh, do you need to put the slides on? Oh, there they come. Okay. Um, and as Jerry explained, I am a, a geologist uh, by training. Um, but like a lot of sedimentary geologists, eventually you start working in what we call modern environments, what you've got out there right now. And we do that in order to sort of understand, be able to directly observe some processes, do experiments, and establish sort of rates. Um, and this is what um, eventually led me to zero in on Southern California um, as a steady system. What I want to talk to you about today is um, uh, the results of a study that uh, we got started on around in uh, 2005 uh, using um, this local sort of continental shelf system as a means of sort of testing the ability of dead skeletal material, shells and other debris, such as you might pick up with a kid walking along the beach, um, as a record of the recent past to give us a deeper historical perspective on ecological change. So I've got some geology in here. It's not possible to explain this system without, um, it's, it's a geological sort of analysis of ecologic history, um, but it's largely sort of uh, front loaded here. I want to thank my funding sources, not only NSF, but uh, a very important uh, grant from uh, USC's Sea Grant that provided bridging funds to make this possible. Okay, let's see, that didn't work. Am I pointing this the wrong? Okay, okay, great. So, um, as it says, there are many, uh, many sort of different kinds of human stresses. Uh, acting on marine ecosystems from the direct tech of shellfish and finfish and kelp and things like that um, to influences that come from uh, the, uh, uh, runoff from land such as sort of fertilizers and direct modification, physical modification of, of uh, habitat by armoring shorelines and, and dredge and spoil. And of course these can affect our um, benthic and, and our uh, marine sort of communities in many different sort of ways. Um, and so the major challenge uh, for, you know, restoration of these systems is really initially, of course, just to figure out um, has in fact anything in the system changed, which takes historic perspective. Um, if in fact it's changed, what has changed and uh, why, and of course to guide 
um, restoration, what our targets should be, some insight into what was natural and whether or not we can sort of recover that. Now, all of this entails that we get some historic perspective on what's been going on, and there are many ways to approach that. Here in Southern California, um, you've had some sort of wonderful sort of long-term monitoring of, uh, for example, the Open California Current System by these Cal Kofi reports uh, going back, I believe, into sort of the 1950s. Uh, we can get some insights in deeper time, but still direct from direct sort of human observation, uh, the reports of captain's logs, but even wonderful sort of books like uh, Steinbeck's Log of the Sea of Cortez. And of course, we can also use um, this uh, geologic approach of taking a sedimentary core, which is like a needle biopsy that you send down into the seabed. And I am a huge fan of sedimentary cores. I do coring myself. Uh, but there are still limits to what you can, information you can get from the sedimentary core. It's a very small volume, right? Three or four um, inch diameter, and you take a centimeter. So mostly what you're recovering from that are the uh, remains of microscopic organisms, sort of plankton or sort of benthic. Uh, but of course, we know that we're also interested in larger bodied things, not only fish, but sort of benthic uh, mollusks and whatever. And so there are really uh, limits to what we can get. Um, from cores and, of course, from uh, commercial reports and things like that. They tend to be focused on our exploited species rather than the full diversity. So what I want to talk to you about today is a novel approach uh, to getting historic ecologic information. And I want to focus on a challenging but really important environment, and that is the continental shelf. This is a broad, relatively shallow water platform that's adjacent to the, the continents, continental shelf, it's a good characterization, goes down to a maximum depth of around 100 or sort of 200 meters, and then you have a steeper uh, sloping slope uh, down to the deep ocean floor, which is, you know, you're talking there are thousands of meters of water depth. Um, the continental shelf is generally within the um, ownership of the local nation. And it's usually referred to as an EEZ, you know, explosive economic zone, an EEZ. It is where most of our marine biodiversity is located because these waters are shallow. They tend to be fairly productive, both because of the runoff of nutrients from land and from upwelling of deep currents that are brought up along that sort of slope. Um, and they're also relatively shallow. So the seabed for much of it may be within the photic zone receiving light. And so this is the kind of water depth where coral reefs form. Um, but, of course, in higher latitudes, you don't have that. Instead, you've got these soft sedimentary um, uh, platform dipping gently. Now, these are also extremely interesting. They're very important to sort of humans, but they're, of course, also very subject to human stressors, both from um, exploitation of those fish and uh, shellfish. This is where most of our um, oil exploration and extraction occurs. And of course, this is the first sort of marine waters to receive pollutants uh, running off from urban areas uh, such as here. And each of those red dots, in fact, is the pipe opening of an ocean outfall from one of the major publicly operated treatment works um, here just in your LA Orange County uh, view, which for this group, I don't need to say where that is. Okay. Now, even though Southern California, that continental shelf, this Southern California bite, is one of the best known and most studied continental shelves in the entire world, nonetheless, most of what we know about the bottom communities on that shelf um, has been learned since the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. And that was the federal act that required that publicly operated treatment works, as well as others, had to monitor the ocean environment uh, to determine the spatial extent of impact of wastewater um, and to establish sort of reference uh, uh, areas. And so this has been going on. This is um, LA County Sanitation District's um, research vessel uh, that they go out uh, taking uh, bottom samples. They sample the seabed, and in fact, they use the condition of the sediments, the, the appearance, the grain size, and the color of the sediment and then the species composition of the organisms living in the seabed, that is one of their best indicators of the ecologic health and well-being of the 
the, of the ecosystem and the overlying water itself, in addition, of course, to microbial studies of the water column. So what I'm proposing here is using, instead of very laborious and scientifically limited sedimentary cores, that we simply use all the dead skeletal material that accumulates in the seabed um, as a record of recent ecological sort of time. Um, and this is a great picture of the seabed off of, uh, in the Gulf of Maine, and you can see these uh, double-barreled siphons. Those are of burrowing clams that are beneath that quite sandy seabed, and there are other kinds of sort of living sort of organisms there, but you see all that white skeletal debris Right, so those are just the shells of past generations of bivalves, some of them of clams and snails. Some of them would have died last week. Some of them may have died sometime in the past, but they are past, right? So they are a record of the past, and we can um, compare their composition with that of the um, living community around them. Now, this is probably the most important slide in the whole talk, and after you get this, you can go to sleep. This is my metaphor for dead skeletal material. It's what we call time averaged, okay, in the teenager's bed, bedroom floor, right? The kid comes home, strips off the t-shirt, goes on the floor, blah, blah. The next day, does the same thing, kicks off the shoe. Later in the week, right, the new puppy comes in, maybe walks off with a shoe. Um, younger sister comes in, drops a toy, okay? But at the end of the week, you can go in there and sweep all of that material together and you get a time average, or more appropriately, a time summed picture of what went on, right? Now that is going to accum uh, include a signal of some rare events. For example, a collared shirt from dinner with grandparents. You're going to have a sense of athletics and things that happened outside that room. Okay, you get the, the idea. It's a fundamentally different kind of picture than a snapshot of the kid running out of the kitchen door late for school, okay? That snapshot has very high temporal acuity, very high sharpness, but it is a single instant of time, as opposed to a time averaged accumulation that is temporally coarser, but is different kind of information, but arguably, for some purposes, more valuable. So the time exposure can still be useful if it's not too coarse, and not too biased by loss in what we call between habitat transport okay, of, of material. So this is what a lot of my work has been and what brought me out to Southern California. It's determining the time frame of time averaging in naturally occurring assemblages of dead shells um, and also the extent to which postmortem processes have biased input because of perhaps selective removal of really thin-shelled species or small-bodied or that sort of thing, right? And the fact that different species have different lifespans and thus rates at which a population turns over and contributes its shells to the seabed. So fundamentally, as a geologist, I'm interested in the recycling of calcium carbonate and its longer-term sequestration. But this was a great place to come study, and I love this shot. It's Adam Tomasevich, my long-term collaborator. He was a postdoc at the very beginning, and Ron Villardi, one of our biologists. They came out here and started interacting and, and, uh, co and with the uh, wastewater um, agencies because, of course, they had been required to, vent the, uh, to sample. And they gave us access to these time series of which species had been living where and in what abundance um, ever since the 1970s. And then, rather than throw away all the dead skeletal material that came up in those benthic samples, they gave us what they call the grunge, or the debris. So we, this, this analysis was done exclusively by dumpster diving. Okay, we just went out and got the trash um, that the agencies were uh, tossing out. And so we would go back to Chicago and go through those, um, that grunge and pull out all of the specimens that were taxonomically identifiable, and we ended up focusing just on bivalves, and counted the numbers of individuals per species, and we could then compare that to the number of individuals per species found um, alive. Now, the agencies uh, have been just amazing and wonderful about this. It's been incredibly sort of generous with us. But they could see from the start, they of course loved the idea of other scientists getting you know, new use of their data, and especially 
getting data out of what they had been discarding. Um, and they also, though, saw the potential to see, to, to maybe learn what the pre-urban and certainly the pre-1970s uh, seabed was actually like. Um, and so they were uh, terrific. And of course, then I used some of these materials, uh, not only with graduate students, but this is a class uh, from a couple years ago that's a mix of both undergrads and grads. And part of the class was picking through uh, samples and uh, beginning to generate what we call dead data uh, as a counterpart to the live data that the agencies produce. Okay, so let me get in what, what does the system look like and what did we find? This is what the seabed looks like um, when you're in water depths off Los Angeles and Orange County greater than around 30 meters, that is greater than around 100 feet. Um, it is hom very homogeneous. Uh, muddy sand or sandy mud or actually mud. It is dominated mostly by organisms that burrow beneath the sediment water interface. So you see here there's a lot of sort of lumpiness to that surface, but that's because of the things, the organisms that are living underneath, and some of them are, are sedentary and others are sort of moving, and so they uh, hump up the sediment. You notice that there are a, a few organisms that live on the sediment water interface, but they're mobile organisms such as these uh, uh, brittle stars. Okay, and that's a typical in the gobs and gobs of, of, uh, of worms, of course. Now, when we look at the death assemblage, that is a dead shell material that we sieve out of that same sample, and they use like a one millimeter sieve, um, we find that present in the dead shell assemblage are the same species present in the living, okay, and that there's there's high fidelity of the dead to the living. Uh, and this has been powerful, and I've found this in global meta-analyses, that uh, death assemblages, despite all of our concerns that we may have about post-mortem transport by storms and whatever, there is very, very little of that. Fundamentally, things accumulate in the sediment in which they lived within or sort of on top of. However, a remarkably large number of these dead shell assemblages also included the shells of species that have never, in the 50-some years of benthic sampling, been sampled alive. And those were really interesting things. They were a whole bunch of filter-feeding organisms that live at, that is on top of the sediment, uh, the sediment itself, they are epifauna and specifically including a lot that actually would attach to the seabed and had zero tolerance for the soft med, mud in which they were found embedded as dead shells. These were things like terebratulid brachiopods, which every Paleozoic paleontologist adores. Uh, these were the clams of the Paleozoic. They're very unusual today. Uh, two different um, kinds of large-bodied scallops, calcareous worm tubes, uh, barnacles, various erect calcifying bryozoans, or these moss animals. And these didn't just occur a few places. They were occurred widely as dead-only occurrences of these species. And as I said, they could be 30 to 70% of the shells. And so um, we were like, what is with this? Oops. And our first guess was that, well, these things, this entire community of epifauna sort of filter feeders, never sampled alive and made absolutely no sense for the mud, that they must be relics from when sea level was lower and just rising, which is commonly characterized by what we call sediment starvation. When sea level is first beginning to rise, very little sediment usually comes out to the shelf. And the, you commonly will have sort of shell gravelly conditions that would have favored these organisms. So. Um, so we started looking at this. We went in, and to determine how old these shells were, we used a uh, method, a geologic method of age dating known as amino acid raspization. It is calibrated using radiocarbon that everyone is familiar with. And so what we went in, whoops, we went and took about, dated around, a, age dated around 100 specimens of this uh, brachiopod, this laqueous articulate brachiopod. This is a living one attached by a little pedicle to a piece of rock. And this plot shows you the number of specimens that we found that dated from this increment from the most recent 
hundred years, how many from before. And what you see from this frequency distribution is that we had some dead laqueous brachiopod shells that were as old as sort of 9,000 years or so. That is, some of them dated, they were living and died out there from when that part of the seabed was first inundated during uh, when the ice, ice ages, you know, when ice, polar ice melted and sea level globally began to rise. And clearly, the brachiopods were living and dying out there on all those subsequent millennia up to the present day. Now, this is very typical that we find um, most of the shells are relatively young, and that's because the old ones have mostly been uh, uh, be destroyed. But when we zero in and look more closely now at just the age frequency distribution of brachiopod shells from the last 1,000 years, we see that, in fact, they were most recently abundant um, in the, you know, almost sort of 200 years ago, around in the mid-1800s AD. And then, in fact, we have no shells that died more recently than 1910 AD. And so we were completely taken aback by this. We thought that they had all probably died out 5,000 years ago or so. So we couldn't imagine they were sort of extending up to the present. But if they did that, then why did they then die out? Now, um, we think that this absence, this dead-only occurrence, isn't simply because biologists haven't made enough effort to find them living. Um, every single dot in this map of uh, Southern California is a sampling site from an agency or a bite-wide synoptic survey. But you'll see that only a subset, only these with the white sort of circles, we've got some jittering problems over here, are live occurrences of laqueous. And yet we have sort of abundant sort of dead occurrences of their shells, occurrences of their sort of dead shells. Um, so there's been no shortage of sort of effort uh, to find these. It's simply that they now only live in a few places right at the shelf slope break, the outer edge of the shelf where there's still some rocks, and all around uh, the um, Catalina Island. And the same thing is true of the scallops. Now, unfortunately, the colors are reversed here. The black are the live occurrences of scallops of this um, Clamus histata, again, found only over here on Catalina Island, but abundantly as dead shells along sort of the mainland shelf. And the same thing for the second, more southern uh, species. A few live occurrences um, but only on sort of the deeper part of the, uh, uh, the mainland shelf. So we think that what was, uh, as, a, as a result, what was going on is that, um, in fact, these things had been uh, uh, living out there, but have truly uh, gone recently uh, locally extinct. And we think the same is true for all of these other groups that we find occurring only as, um, only as dead or only organisms. Okay, now this is the last of the geology slides, uh, but I have to show you because this was a real tour de force of modeling by Adam. What this is showing you, and I'm going to show you other plots that are oriented the same way. Geologists do geologic time several ways. Here we've got geo geologic time, time uh, along the horizontal axis. This is now. This is 2000 AD. This is 1492, Columbus, and all that, OK? So these are calendar sort of years. And down here, I've uh, and, and, and what this is showing here is the, in gray, this is the actual frequency. This is the abundance of shells in each of these age categories, OK? And the most, and, and, and what is shown in black is our reconstruction of the original density of living brachiopods on the seabed to produce um, this observed uh, frequency in the death assemblage. And the difference between these two, what we've basically done is we have restored all the shells that have been lost to post-mortem wear and tear in the millennia since the present day. Okay? And we have done a lot of work on that before we ever started doing these, these brachiopods. And so we reconstruct that the original living density of brachiopods on the continental shelf was around 30 individuals per square meter. And it was fairly constant at that level up until the early 1800s when those populations went into decline to now only find the last living brachiopod died in around 1910. Now, since we produced this, um, this graph in this paper in 2017, we have dated an additional 
um, 80 brachypod shells. And we now have a shell, an individual who died in 1940. And we have a second individual that died in 1910. Uh, but we simply cannot find any 21st century or any younger 20th century um, populations. This group was basically uh, toast. So it thrived for thousands of years, uh, in the decline. That decline did not start any later than the 1870s. And this is uncertainty limits because of the sample sizes and the uncertainties in radiocarbon calibration. And fundamentally, this group has been extirpated on the mainland shelf by the early 20th century. So although this had been a real tour de force to generate this, and we thought this was deeply cool in itself, we realized we were never going to get this published unless we could explain or made an attempt to explain why, what had happened. So this is the really sort of cool and interesting part, why you came to the talk. OK, so what drove the decline? First off, we were thinking all kinds of things. Maybe climate change, you know, because open ocean warming. And both Laqueus, this brachypod, as well as uh, the one scallop, really are thriving today further north in much cooler water. So uh, warm, warming water would be a great way to kill these things off, except that that started too late. We did not start warming um, out here until the early, uh, the early 20th century. We also thought, of course, of uh, nutrients from wastewater. But there again, it's too late. This is the Hyperion plant, uh, which opened up in 1925 with basically surf zone release of, um, of, uh, of, of, screened, um, of screened solids and, and, uh, and liquid nutrients. But again, that's too late. By the 1920s and 30s, these brachiopods and presumably these other filter feeders um, had already gone extinct. Other things, we knew that siltation, solid sediment, was somehow implicated because these things are found as dead shells embedded in mud, okay, in the top 10 to 15 centimeters of the seabed. And so we thought, we thought of ways to um, in, increase the amount of mud out there, but there is no evidence from tree ring and other climate indicators of any increase in rainfall or change in the El Ninos that would have changed the runoff of solid sediment from land. I also thought, well, maybe channelization of the LA and San Gabriel rivers, right? Turning those things into sluices so when it rained, any sort of sediment released from the land would be shunted directly out to sea. But as you guys know, uh, these rivers were not concreted until the 1950s. It was these devastating floods in the 30s that really started that process. So here again, this was entirely too late. And then I was sort of like, you know, the slap of the forehead heard around the world, like, what am I fooling around with these 20th century? These guys were, you know, locally extinct by the 20th century. This was some kind of stressor in the 19th century that drove these things God. The decline was in the 19th century. So not being a California girl, I did not know much about Southern California history, but I knew there was a mission era. And so um, I started looking into pre-urban land use. And 19th century livestock and overgrazing during both the Spanish mission and early uh, statehood does have the correct timing. Now. In fact, it's the only sort of human stressor out there at that time that I could figure out, particularly one that would influence um, solid sediment runoff. It turns out the Spanish introduced cattle and sheep in 1771, the San Gabriel mission right out here. It was a cattle-based economy to the 1860s when they shifted to sheep in the 19, uh, 1870s. And then going to the agronomy literature and the range ecology literature, what you find is that if you have unmanaged graze lands, unmanaged sort of grazing, open range, and you let them loose, and that's it. You round them up once a year in the rodeo to brand them and, and harvest them for hides. This was a hide and a tallow market, not a beef market. Um, that your sediment runoff from those kinds of lands is 10 times higher than if you have managed grazing. That is, if you move your cattle around from pasture to pasture and, and that kind of management versus zero sediment yield from prairie. That is, when it rains on a prairie and the water that runs off, it's clear. It is not carrying any sediment. Okay? So that told me I would have probably the, the, um, the, 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 some purchase on, on getting um, sediment uh, supply uh, off of this thing. 
So I decided, though, in order to really do this and to get any attention, I was going to have to quantify um, the number of cattle and the magnitude of this sediment runoff. And so here is a plot I never thought I'd see, much less produce. This is a quantitative plot, a quantitative history of cows in Los Angeles, decade by decade, from 1771 to today. And how I did this, uh, first off, this is a log plot. That's 10 cows, 100 cows, 1,000 cows, 10,000 cows, OK? And that is going straight up. That is a logarithmic. That is a straight astronomical rate. I used two sources of data. I looked at a lot of stuff, but I decided the mission data, these were sort of reports in Bancroft's seven volume History of California, sort of summarizes them by decades. That's how I used it. Used the mission data up to uh, the 1832 uh, secularization. Uh, there were very little sort of reliable data during the Mexican era. And then 1850 was the first of the US agricultural censuses. So I used exclusively US census data then for the rest of it. So only two data sources, and with this gap in here. And this is a conservative sort of plotting of the number of cattle in blue, horse way underestimated. No one was keeping track of, of horses um, and sheep. And in black is the summary number, and that is what is known as animal units, not astronomical units, although these are astronomical numbers of animals. But animal units, which is something that US uh, North American range, a cow is one, a horse is one, a sheep and goat is 0.2. Okay. So I you know, discounted my sheep numbers and gotten these numbers. Now, these are very conservative numbers, actually. Although I took data from San Fernando and the San Gabriel missions, and then also from the Spanish land grant, uh, crown grant uh, uh, ranchos during the mission data, because those were independent um, sort of operations. Now, in that literature, I found a key piece of information, and that is that in 1850, the carrying capacity, it basically took 10 acres to support one cow. So that meant that in a 1 million acre sort of uh, uh, watershed, the carrying capacity would have been 100,000 animals. And so what I did was sort of then compare at what point did this number of, of this conservative estimate of the number of livestock out there uh, reach sort of carrying capacity. And we probably reached, in fact, carrying capacity at least by 1830. And people were observing only low value annual grasses by the 1820s. And the mission padres were having the neophytes go out and cull feral horses by 1805 because they were out competing the cattle, right? Because the horses were just let loose too, right? And so these rates of rise are like, you know, microbes on an agar little Petri dish. I mean, this is just completely unconstrained uh, uh, growth. So probably we started uh, yielding sort of mud out to the continental shelf, probably in the very early part of the 1800s. Now, now this is a plot of, um, oh, and there should be a, a, a tractor over here. This is the number of acres of land that uh, were devoted to agriculture, to cultivated sort of crops. And that all started fundamentally with statehood in 1850 with sort of changes in the, the trespass laws. And you had a one-to-one -one conversion. Notice that by 1900, basically all one million available acres in the coastal plain watershed were now devoted to crops. We still had cows, but they were, they were now sort of corralled and managed. And of course, we had dairy cows, and there was a small um, hog processing, you know, okay. Any, anyway, with the yields, now you can go and then sort of generate how many tons of sediment per acre under these different land uses. And what I figured out was basically you had a peak of around 9 megatons, that is 9 million tons of solid sediment per year was coming off of the land, uh, off the watershed into, um, into the adjacent uh, continental shelf from your time of sort of peak cows from the the mid-1800s all the way up probably uh, well into the 20th century. Because remember that soil conservation efforts, you know, contour plowing and all of that, that didn't get started until the 30s and the 40s. Okay, so this was agriculture. It was intense agriculture, but it was without soil conservation. 
Okay, and then down below is just showing you our, our brachypod story. Okay, so I think what happened, this is what we think, you know, that the, the cows did it, basically, helped then by uh, cultivation without soil conservation. We had 100 years of mud going in. We don't see this as something sort of catastrophic, right? This was death by a, a thousand sort of cuts. Anytime there was a big storm, now instead of having clear water run off the land, we were having this sediment-charged water. I think there may have been a bit of a perfect storm, though, going on in Southern California, because as you guys know, this is semi-arid. And so nothing happens, and then it rains, and it's a real gully washer. So that also promotes very high sort of yield. And we have another thing going on here in Southern California, as in some other arid areas. And that is that when the um, sediment, uh, uh, the, the sediment-charged floodwaters reach the sea, they are actually have a very high density, and that's because not only does the water have all of that suspended sediment in it, but because it's arid, that water is also fairly salty, right? It has picked up salts from the soil. And so as a result, when it hits the sea, rather than extending out as a freshwater plume across the surface of the ocean, as it would in the Pacific Northwest, and then having that sediment sort of, right, settle out and diffusely down to the seabed, Instead, in Southern California and also along the Red Sea, another study area of mine, this sediment comes out and it basically goes right along the seabed, right? It goes down right where it hurts, that benthic community. Now, it would deposit only a centimeter or so of sediment, which is actually a lot, but it's far too much sort of turbidity for these, these filter-feeding organisms, particularly the ones like the brachypods, that are permanently attached to the seabed. They cannot readjust themselves upward to the new, higher sort of uh, seafloor level. And so if you sort of visualize this process now going on for 100 years um, and uh, operating and hitting a, a suite of organisms least capable of adjusting themselves, all of these are slow-living, low-fecundity organisms, um, it's maybe no wonder that they, uh, that they uh, went, went extinct. And I was just looking up, you know, what, how does nine megatons compare with other, um, with other uh, uh, rivers and whatever. And it turns out that the Eel River up in northern California, it's very, very heavily studied by sedimentary geologists. And it has an annual sediment yield and sediment supply to the sea of basically of nine megatons per year. Uh, and so it's well studied. And there, the continental shelf adjacent to the Eel River is famously muddy. Uh, storms, that winter storms that come and provide energy and some reworking of the seabed, they simply redistribute the mud a little bit so that it's now spread further away than just at the mouth of the river uh, on the basis of sort of years and months and, and over sub sub subsequent years. Okay? So um, I think we've got a reasonable sort of mechanism, but it is made worse by these arid, semi-arid conditions down here because of these hyperpycnal bottom flowing um, uh, floodwaters rather than diffuse uh, surface freshwater plumes. Okay, so to wrap up, what do we know? Uh, what do the dead say about where things stand? What have we learned about what the seabed actually looked like um, and where we stand in recovery and what's next? I think it's clear uh, from the dead shells that the LA and Orange County shelf in their natural, what I call pre-cal state, um, there was a whole mosaic of habitats and communities out there in direct contact, con contrast to the really quite monotonous, widespread, muddy sand, sandy mud that we have today. Uh, the middle shelf was a mosaic and had had at least three different kinds of communities living just on shell gravel. One of them were these brachypods, and this is shown here from some bottom uh, remote operated uh, video um, images that the USGS has taken on the Catalina Island shelf. Uh, every single one of those uh, beautiful light colored little marble shaped things is a live laqueous uh, brachypod. You can tell from this image that it's fairly sandy and even some rocks and these this pink stuff is gorgonian, that is a soft coral, that again, it's an attached sort of filter feeding organism. And so we visualize that all along the mainland shelf, and I should mention 
We've got dead only brachypods from Santa Barbara to the US Mexican border. Everywhere where the agencies and SCORP um, uh, coordinated bite surveys have samples, we have dead only brachypods and dead only scallops. So this is a huge area. Um, but we think it was uh, had a whole sort of diversity of, of, uh, of, of other organisms. Here are some other, I can't resist, I know you're not Paleozoic paleontologist, but who can resist pictures of brachypods, living brachypods on the seabed? We have them in little clumps. We got excited. Oh, then we start carpets of these things. You know, it's just insane, but you can see how coarse grained um, the sediment is. As the Catalina Shelf is still quite sandy and gravelly. We, in addition to those brachypod communities, and, and, um, we also had two different kinds of scallop communities. Both of these were distributed. They occurred in shallower water than the brachypods. These were in waters only um, 30 to 100 meters depth. The brachypods were deeper. Uh, this is an image just of you know, a swimming scallop on some shell gravelly bottom uh, from, some, from over in uh, uh, northern Europe. But it gives you an idea of what the seabed would have looked like. Okay, um, and uh, we also find in shallower, wa in, in shallower water parts of our cores, our longer cores, um, that there were um, really abundant clumps of these mussels. These are horse model mussels, mo modiolus. This is an example. We don't have any pictures from here in California. This is from the Shetland Islands. Um, but these are really only rarely found. A diver off Redondo Beach around 20 years ago found a clump, and a clump showed up. Some clumps show up on the sandy, shallow shelf around the, uh, the Catalina Islands and other uh, islands again. But we think these apparently, based on the dead shells, the inner shelf, this you know less than 30 meters, this was a really common sort of uh, community type that basically is another completely sort of lost uh, community. As I said, we have not yet dated any of these other things yet. We're in the process of do, getting age uh, frequency distribution data on the scallops as well. But we suspect that these all went extinct at about the, um, at about the same time. Um, now, that mosaic of habitats in the pre-cal shelf did include patches of mud. But that mud, we can tell, again, from the dead shells, that that mud had a far greater number of different kinds of feeding types than muds on the modern mainland shelf today. Um, and it was, these muds were like these little patches of mud that you see on, on Catalina Island. It, you can look at it and see it's not fluffy, right? It's fine grained, but it doesn't have that uh, fluffy look to the surface that uh, the mainland shelf, uh, the mainland shelf has. So we think on the mainland shelf that these muds, these widespread muds, that are, we believe, largely a legacy of the 19th century, um, they, of course, were augmented by solid sediment that was delivered uh, from uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, the muds on the mainland shelf today are much healthier than they were in 1970. Right? The biologists themselves know that. We have higher diversity. We have a greater variety of feeding, of, of bivalve feeding groups. Um, however, and the sediments now, they're, they're greenish or brownish instead of black, another good indicator that the seabed is much healthier than it was in the 1970s. However, again, from our dead shell assemblages, we know that these muds, although healthier than 1970, are still not recovered to pre-urban. We know, for example, that right now, there are only 1 to 2 percent of all bivalve individuals are what we call obligate deposit feeders, such as this nucleana. Whereas in the pre-cal patches of mud, that trophic group, that feeding group, would have constituted 15 or 20 percent. So we can give the biologists, the wastewater biologists, a target. They will now, we can confirm, yes, it is much better than it had been, but it is not, in fact, yet where you would want it if it were modern. And in fact, they will have reached that point when they have something more like 10 times the number of obligate deposit feeders. A bit nerdy sounding, but you know we're talking about clams. This is really pretty cool. <laughs> clams are most of your biomass. So standing back and thinking of an ecologist, um, 
This mud has completely transformed the mainland shelf. We have less habitat complexity, and for the biologists here, less beta diversity. We have less complete and effective filtering of the seawater because we don't have as many filter feeding organisms there. It's a more detritus-based system, which means it's less efficient nutrient cycling. Basically now, when planktonic food falls and settles through the water column down to the seabed, if you've got filter feeders, that is their food. That plankton goes directly into forming bivalve clam flesh that then fish and other organisms will eat. What you've got going on now is that food comes all the way down to the seabed as dead organic matter. It then enters a microbial loop. Microbes process it, and only at that point then do the detritus eaters consume it. So it is far more sort of steps and a much slower cycling of food and nutrients through the entire ecosystem. And all of this before our stressors piled on. So um, there's still much to test out here. Um, I'm still concerned, you know, was solid sediment enough? Um, I want to take some sediment cores on the continental shelf where we can discriminate the um, rates of mud delivery. Uh, there's too much, you know, biological sort of stirring and rates of sediment accumulation are too slow on the continental shelf to do that. Um, but nonetheless, just with the data we've got so far, based entirely on discarded skeletal debris um, from other, from the agency's um, biological sort of monitoring, we've got a whole series of unique insights that the biologists would never just couldn't come up with because, of course, they got started looking too late. Um, but also some really pretty sobering insights into um, this system. Uh, first off, we did have extirpation of a distinct ecosystem that thrived for thousands of years and has been lost only in the last 200. That loss was anthropogenic, but it was pre-urban. I don't think any of us were thinking of any of the deterioration out there being pre-urban. We were all sort of focused on, on wastewater. And it is making all of us sort of think about this um, again. Um, the loss was really actually quite slow. It constitutes an ecologic collapse because it was, you know, pretty fast on one scale. But would we have actually recognized that? If something like that were going on today, would we notice it? It would have been so incremental. Right? This would have been longer than the uh, career of any dedicated biologist. Right? So it would have to be one biologist handing down to another generation of scientists and then noting it. Uh, and so that is itself very sobering. And it also was initiated by solid sediment. Uh, this is the first detection of solid sediment as a human stressor on the open shelf. We are not talking about coastal estuaries. We're not talking about lakes. We're not talking about lagoons. We're talking about the open continental shelf, 400 kilometer long stretch um, of open continental shelf. So a huge area uh, impacted. And this is a stressor that wasn't even on our radar. So that's all kind of depressing. Um, but then finally, you know, we are also finding that um, this recovery from the wastewater impacts is nearly complete. We think that mud, uh, that 19th century legacy mud, is probably there to stay, right? No one's going to go out there with a leaf blower. Uh, there's too much, you know, and, and move it away. And Adam Tomasevich, my collaborator on this, is um, more sanguine than, than I am. I mean, he thinks, we think if any area were to come back, it would probably be the Orange County shelf, which is still quite sandy. Um, but that is fundamentally sort of the new normal. But it does clearly put a premium on protecting those still standy island shelves uh, where this uh, fauna otherwise entirely lost uh, to the mainland um, uh, still survives. So um, thank you for your attention on this, but I wanted to have a slide, and gratitude is the only term that would work. The extraordinary sort of generosity and engagement of um, the uh, agencies, including um, LA Public uh, Library, I wrote to them to see if someone else had produced a cows over time history of LA. Um, and these various agencies, both Squirp and uh, Scamet, uh, volunteer and other agencies that really 
um, make this such a wonderful uh, candy shop for scientific analysis. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sue, for a great story, and I think it's a wonderful example of the kind of detective work a scientist has to do to unravel some of these stories in collaboration with other scientists, and, and also looking at data sets one would normally not think about. And I'm very pleased that you discovered that the culprit is the cow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kill, this has had some great co, uh, uh, subtitles like Killer Cow and Apocalypse Cow and my favorite librarian at the LA Public who said, Cowabunga. <laughs> like, perfect. <laughs> you know, that's an amazing detective story, tying it back to those romantic California days of the cattle, cult, cattle culture. Most of us are aware that the cattle on land changed the vegetation forever on land, but who would have thunk that it, it created a whole uh, problem on the, on the, the shallow shelves just from runoff? Yeah. That's an amazing detective story. It was, you know, when I first thought of cows, I went to my guru at LA County Sanitation, Don Cadian, who's a wonderful resource for the entire region, and I said, Don, Adam and I have these dead brachiopods. He says, oh no, I know, I know there are those dead shelves there. And I said, yeah, but we've dated them and we found they only really disappeared in the last 200 years. I can't figure anything except maybe cows. Could it have been cows? He says, Sue, 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 you. There were huge, insane numbers of cows. And so Don was very supportive, sort of like, go for it. So I just went back to Chicago and spent five weeks in the library learning everything about LA cow history. But and California uh, still has five million beef cattle, and I, the, more yeah. than more than that number of dairy cattle, and they still take a, a toll on on the environment. Less less on the ocean, but and the amount of water they drink is enormous. Yeah. Much of your research is predicated on age dating the shells, mm -hmm. and could you tell us how you go about dating a shell? Yeah, well, how we used to do it was simply by radiocarbon, right? And the shell is a mineral. These shells are either aragonite or calcite. Both of those, it's calcium carbonate, so it's CaCO3. So you date the, the carbon that is in through the shell. Now, the problem or the challenge with radiocarbon is that um, you can't use it effectively on very young material, and that's because of two things going on. One is the bomb effect. Uh, when the uh, above ground sort of nuclear testing, it produced and put a lot of, of carbon-14 into the atmosphere. And so that, of course, gets taken into the body. And so all we can say is this is a post-bomb, meaning it is younger than 1950. The other complication to radiocarbon in recent time is what's known as the Zeus effect. And that is the burning of coal and other uh, fossil fuels. So what that does, it produces and it puts a lot of old, that is carbon-13 and carbon-12, carbon-14 dead carbon up into the atmosphere. And so that dilutes the carbon-14. So what we use is called amino acid rasmization. And what that, how that works, amino acids are things like, you know, glutamine, and okay, there's like 23 of them, right? That's what your proteins are made of. And these are complicated molecules, but the cool thing is here on Earth, all amino acids have a left-handed form. And it's one of the arguments that life originated, or what we have today, at a single origination. Okay, or, okay. now what happens post-mortem? After an organism dies, is that spontaneously, a given molecule, a given amino acid, will racemize, that it will, it will flip to the right-handed form. Now, it will randomly, that right might flip back. So over time, you start from 100% left-handed molecules of a given amino acid, and it becomes eventually 50-50. Now, every single amino acid racemizes, that it, is, it equilibrates to 50-50 at a different rate. So what we do is I send, we send our shells, our prepared shells, to northern Arizona, my colleague Daryl Kaufman, who runs an amino acid rasmization lab in northern Arizona. 
and he determines the right-left ratio of a whole series of amino acids, some of them fast racemizing and some of them slow. The fast ones give us a purchase on time in the first most recent few decades or centuries, and the ones that take a long time to equilibrate give us a yardstick for older material. It's calibrated using, radi re using radiocarbon, but we're not using radiocarbon to date these really young shells. Now, the beauty of amino acid racemization, and this is, this is a big beauty above radiocarbon, is that the resolving power of amino acid racemization dating is decadal, meaning that when we get information from Daryl, we find out if that shell died in 1920 or 1930. That is a real wow, as opposed to radiocarbon, which has a plus minus of at least 250 years. And of course, for real young stuff, all we know is it's post-bomb, sometime since 1950. So see, we just couldn't resolve this if we only had radiocarbon. So the development and refinement of amino acid racemization dating, it still has limits. For example, it works best with our situation where these are um, shells from the bottom of the sea. If you tried to date like land snails on land because of thermal, you know, temperature variation through the day and the season, that will, you know, mess up your racemization rates. And that's how this method got started and why people were very skeptical of amino acid dating when it was first introduced back in the 1970s. But since then, there's been a lot further work on it. And so it's um, immensely, immensely powerful. Uh, it's gotten more expensive per shell, but radiocarbon has gotten cheaper per shell. Uh, so we're finding our way uh, into continuing. But the other reason we can get this information is that we do date large samples. Okay, so that information of reconstructing the density of living brachiopods per square meter was based on dating, you know, 200 and some shells, individual shells. Okay. So we have a question in the back. Well, I want to say what an amazing, challenging um, a project you have on hand. Um, nothing was mentioned about earthquakes affecting this, and I want to know what can I'm we sorry, do? On what nothing was mentioned about whether or not earthquakes affected oh. this, and what can we do to protect Catalina because Catalina is doing so well. Is there anything that could put Catalina at risk? Thank you. Um, okay, a couple things. Earthquakes, uh, you guys probably all know the earthquake history better than I do. It is possible to recognize um, earthquakes in sediments uh, because that jiggling, of course, extends under the sea and it will jiggle loose boluses of sediment which then, you know, collapse and run out and they form seismites. Uh, so those are readable, but those tend to be local sort of deposits rather than blankets. And so I would not, I think very few people would sort of go to the open ocean and expect to reconstruct the history of earthquakes from, from sediments. The process is just sort of too localized. Now, Catalina Island, um, you know, protecting it, that moves into the social and sort of political realm and sort of policy realm. Um, we're hopeful, you know, that this science gets into the right hands, and one reason I'm always happy to give public talks about what we're finding and the tremendous sort of value of, of Catalina Island and the others. That said, I was thinking, oh, you know, since all these brachypods are super, super happy on Catalina, well, that's because, of course, you know, it obviously didn't have any history of grazing or anything. It's like, that's wrong. <laughs> Turns out, you know, I, I have a cow plot for Catalina Island, too. I haven't shown you that. That was really insane. I mean, that none, didn't just go up to carrying capacity, but way overshot it. And so it's notorious. And that went on forever, right? They're still extirpating. Into the 40s and 50s, there were livestock and horse, the goats. And so it's sort of like, given all that grazing, right, doesn't that undercut this whole hypothesis? But there are two things going on on Catalina and all of those islands. The Catalina especially, where I have the actual the cow plot. Um, and that is that the island um, is both small and the watersheds are individually small and very steep. 
Now, what happens is steep watershed yields sand-sized particles rather than mud-sized particles. And that's been shown up and down the mainland sort of coast. And so the watersheds are the wrong size and slope to generate abundant sort of mud. The other thing is we know that continental shelf is still very sandy. Uh, K.O. Emery back in the 50s and 60s was doing um, maps of the seabed, and you can look at those maps of his, and it's all sand and gravel. The only places where you have any mud are tiny little, little crescents of mud at the mouths of the one or two of the largest sort of watersheds, right? And so it comes out and it affects a very small area of the, of the shelf. So there simply isn't enough mud generated from that land area to have the same effect despite all the grazing. And the other thing I want to do, but I haven't done yet, is that I think the ratio is wrong. For example, the island, the island is a small area, but because it's an island, it has a continental shelf around the entire perimeter. So it actually has a fairly small ratio of land source area to sink area. Compared, for example, to the Southern California coastal plain, a million acres just of grazable land, that's not including the mountains, just this coastal plain. And then, yes, we have, but we have a shelf only along one edge of that. And as you know, it's quite wide in Orange County, but otherwise it's quite narrow. So now we've got a very large source area feeding a very small sink area. So I think there's several things, but that's the next version of the talk, will be to work in the Catalina Islands. But at first, we're like, oh, man, I should have stopped while I was ahead and only had a cow plot for the mainland. But you need to know wh why. The, you know, why is it persisting? So I think that's why it was, uh, there were multiple things in its favor. I think it may also be less rainfall. I don't know this, but maybe less rain on the islands than on the mainland. So those are other things to look into, the hydrography and really pull the next level of geological but the ratio of watershed to water area is extraordinarily important. With Chesapeake Bay, that has the largest ratio of any estuary in the world. And that's why it's so difficult to yeah. try to restore that. Yeah, in fact, it may be impossible. Yeah, huge. And there's another humbling. case where Rene Dubot, he's the guy who came up with the phrase, think globally, act locally. And he wrote a book about places in the world where humans have enhanced the beauty of the landscape. And he used the Amish country in Pennsylvania as one. And it is gorgeous farmland. But if you look at the inputs to Chesapeake Bay, they don't use tractors, they use horses. They have an awful lot of livestock and it's taken a huge, huge toll mm -hmm. on Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. Who has another question? So I know you're not very sanguine about um, our shelf ever returning to the pre-urban conditions, but presumably there's not very much sediment input now from land. Correct. Um, so are there processes that would slowly erode away this mud or uh, remove it? Yeah, you raise a, group, big, a, a good point. The rate of sediment yield, sediment yield from this urbanized and concreted uh, landscape is now almost nil. It might as well be prairie again from a... But of course, from that paved, um, you know, residential, industrial, and, and whatever, we're getting more runoff, of course, of, of organic pollutants and petrochemicals and metals and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so those are going to interfere with recovery. Those pollutants, um, the warming that's going on is going to interfere with recovering what it used to look like. It's going to look like a warmer version of the past at the very, very least. Um, yeah, but the, the 20th century and ongoing sort of 21st century decline in sediment supply is good. And what we'd have to wait for, though, is prolonged, you know, storm reworking of this. Now, storms, of course, there's something known as storm wave base, right? And that's the water depth of the seabed that feels the effect of storm-sized waves and that those storms have sufficient energy and orbital velocities to set that mud in motion. Um, but the thing is, we've got, well, for example, in the PV shelf, they've got something like 60 centimeters of mud. Now, that's because that's at the pipe opening of the outfall, right? Now, that declines. 
But where we're mostly sort of getting these um, samples, still a Van Veen sample, which is what the guys, the agencies use, it goes down around 15 centimeters, and that's mud. And when I was out there in 2012 on my own cruise with um, with uh, box cores, we've got we've got mud down 50 centimeters. So that is a lot of mud to dig down into. And so regular storms are just not going to have the energy. Because frankly, and this is, see, this is why Adam and I as geologists, why we thought these brachiopods had probably gone extinct several thousand years ago. Because what happens when sea level begins to rise, it starts to, here's the shelf, and sea level is low. It's out here at the shelf slope break 20,000 years ago. And what happens, it begins to rise, and then it rises at really a very rapid rate. Okay, and then it slows. It's like the tide. The tide is at zero velocity when it's low, and then it accelerates to some peak rate, and then it stops again when it gets to max high tide. So you have an acceleration and deceleration. What happens during that accelerating phase of the rising limb, the sea level rise, um, sediment tends to be trapped up in coastal sort of sinks. And once the rate of rise begins to slow, and certainly once it reaches a still stand, which is, it's been at for 6,000 years here, then what happens is sediment typically then does come back and enter and begins to find sediment, begins to build back out across the shelf. And so Adam and I thought as geologists that the mud on the mainland shelf was a product of sea level being at still stand and having been there for 6,000 years. And we were fundamentally looking at those muds were high stand deposits. And that the Shelley, all this, you know, brachiopod, that that was a transgressive lag, if you're a geologist, okay? And so um, that's why we were so surprised that the brachiopods and all of that shell gravel fauna lasted so long, because what that also means is that sediment supply never, re you know, had still not yet resumed to the Southern California shelf. Um, so even as geologists, we've got new insights into this whole um, dynamics of sediment supply and sea level rise. But that contributes to our thinking that that mud is not going anywhere unless people get out there and somehow engineer it away. Because mud should be accumulating there. We've got plenty of water depth. We've got plenty of accommodation. And the mud was brought down. It was accelerated because of the cows. But it was sooner or later going to come out there and turn that shelf back into a muddy, you know, back into a muddy condition but it just did it way before, apparently, naturally, it, it would have. So, so that's why I'm not expecting much. Adam is thinking OC will see it because it's, it's less muddy than the others to begin with. Before we thank uh, Sue for a, a wonderful, wonderful talk, our, our next lecture is a panel discussion, May 16th, and it's the story behind the creation of our Pacific Visions Wing. So it started with what the scientific stories are that we wanted to tell. Peter Kareva from UCLA was involved in many of those. He will be on the panel. And, and the next thing was, how do you translate sci what science speak, you've done it very well, uh, into exhibits for the general public that will entertain, educate, empower. And, and uh, so we're going to have Joe Cortina of Cortina Productions. And then the question is, what kind of a building do you design to put all this in? And uh, we will have an architect from EHDD who, and they are the architects for both the original building and the new wing. And then finally, we will have our own Faria Cotter, who was one of the two people who oversaw it all and who kept them all working together and not fighting with each other uh, to produce a wonderful, wonderful result. So we hope that you will come to that panel discussion. But Susan, thank you for a wonderful, very good, outstanding lecture. Total pleasure. Thank you, guys.